We have um, the wonderful Rich Bernhuk, uh, who is a Victor E. Cameron Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Rice University and the founding director of OpenStax, which is a really cool educational uh, platform as well as research platform if you haven't heard of it. Uh, his research interests lie in new theory, algorithms, and hardware for sensing, signal processing, and machine learning. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Academy of Inventors, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and IEEE. <clears throat> he has received the DOD Vanver Bush Faculty Fellow Award um, as a National Security Science and Engineering Faculty Fellow, uh, the IEEE Signal Processing Society Technical Achievement Award, and the IEEE James H. Mulligan Jr. Educational Medal, among many, many, many others. And we would uh, literally spend a full hour talking about those awards if I was allowed to. So I will stop and I will just say thank you. And he is going to talk about Mad Max, Affine Spline Insights into Deep Learning. And the front page already has us a little bit in suspense. So thank you very much, Rich. Thanks so much for the introduction. It's, uh, it's great to be here today. And what I would like to do in, in this uh, time is to talk just a little bit about the work that we've been doing at Rice over the last couple of years and trying to demystify uh, deep learning, uh, trying to gain some insights into uh, how these systems work, why they work, and, and really importantly, why they fail, uh, or when they fail, why they fail. So uh, hopefully there'll be something in this uh, for, for, for everyone today. So what we're gonna be talking about are prediction problems. And uh, let's just set, set, uh, set up the, the, the uh, prediction problem here. So ba the basic problem is that we have data that we'll call uh, data points that we'll call uh, X. And there's, there's a, some unknown function or operator uh, F that maps uh, a data point uh, into a label, right? For example, X might be a picture of a cat uh, and Y might be the label that it is a picture of a cat. And what we're interested in doing is learning uh, an approximation to this unknown function f uh, using training data. So we're, we're assuming uh, in this particular uh, prediction problem that we have a, a, a labeled training data set of x, y pairs. So pictures of cats and labels that they're pictures of cats. Uh, pictures of dogs and labels that they're pictures of dogs. And we have uh, N of these training data pairs. And what we're gonna do is given these uh, pieces of training data, we're gonna try to find an approximation to that prediction function F, let's call it F theta, where theta are the parameters, that gives us, uh, that, that enables us to put in an unlabeled picture X here and infer what its label should be, right? So that's the prediction problem. And deep nets are, just one particular way uh, out of a whole uh, you know, menagerie of machine learning uh, and advanced statistical techniques that, that uh, exist in order to solve these, uh, uh, these kind of problems. And the interesting thing about deep networks or deep neural networks is that they solve this function approximation problem in a, in a, in a hierarchical way using a composition of uh, very simple operators that are applied successively uh, to the, uh, the input data. So here, we, again, we might have a picture. Here's our, our picture X, our data, uh, piece of data. And it, it is processed by a number of uh, uh, operators. These have uh, a, a particular name in deep learning. They're called layers. Uh, and so we go through layer one, and then the output of layer one is input to layer two, and the output is input to layer three, and so on until we arrive at our final uh, inference or prediction uh, output. And, and here you can see that basically we're, we're forming this F theta, this overall prediction approximation by again, this, this hierarchically applied or this, this composition of these, these operators. And the that grand I would argue that the grand challenge in, in deep learning today, at least as far as mathematically or statistically is, is, is it can be stated very simply. And that is that Deep networks are incredibly easy to describe locally. Uh, uh, we're, I'm not gonna go into too many of the uh, you know, tutorial details around how deep nets are actually built, but even if you, you're not so familiar, they're, they're constructed from just very simple operations. Uh, convolutions, or, or particular kinds of matrix multiplications. 
simple scalar thresholding, just setting uh, uh, negative values when passing, say, from one layer to the next, just setting all the negative values to zero. Uh, and uh, subsampling. And these are all very simple, either linear or affine uh, operations. And uh, 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 they're just extremely easy to describe locally. The problem is, uh, or the grand challenge, is how to describe what actually goes on in a deep net uh, globally. How are all these myriad local operations combined together to, to one global, overall global representation? And, and there's been very limited progress in this direction. And, and folks have, have really treated these deep networks as a, as a black, literally a black, black box, that, that inputs X are put in in one end, inferences Y come out the other. We use different kinds of gradient descent to optimize the parameters inside these black boxes. But it's, there's very little insight into this kind of approach, which has left us scratch the truth right, of what actually goes on inside these systems. And, uh, and I view this as a you know, really important challenge for the next uh, decade or so to try, to try to get inside these systems. So I'm going to talk about one particular approach that we have been looking at at Rice, which is using classical tools from approximation theory, or spl uh, basically spline functions, in order to understand the geometry of what's going on in a, in a deep network. We're not the only folks that have, have seen this connection. There are a number of, of, of groups in the, around the world that are working on spline-based viewpoints of deep nets. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk you know, later about our relationship between our work and, and, and these other ones. So let, let's, let's, uh, let's set up the, the connection between spline functions and, and deep nets. Uh, and, and just uh, recalling right, that a, what a deep net does is solve a approximation problem in this, using this composition of these very simple uh, uh, operators. And what we're gonna see is that these operators, this pink box here that's like corresponds to layer one, the blue box that corresponds to layer two, we're going to see that each of these can be written as a as as one example of a very special family of piecewise affine splines that are actually very easy to understand. So first, let's just briefly set the notation of of spline approximation. Uh, what is a spline? Well, a spline is a a way to approximate a, a, a function that consists of, of two parts. So the first is there's a partition of the input space. So uh, if this is the independent variable, uh, and let's say the blue x is the independent variable, and we're, we're interested in approximating this smooth blue function here that I'm tracing out. Well, the, a spline approximation does, does two key things. The first thing is that it divides this independent variable uh, into a series of, uh, of uh, uh, into a number of regions. Right, and we call the this the the partition of the input space or of the dependent independent variable, and in this and we call it omega. And in this case, we see we've cut this x-axis, the simple one D x-axis, just into four regions: one, two, three, and four. That's the first thing that a spline approximation does. The second thing it does is it 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 build it it, it chooses a very simple mapping on each one of these different. Uh, uh, regions in the partition of the uh, uh, independent variable. And, and for this talk, we're going to focus exclusively on piecewise linear or piecewise affine mappings, which basically means in the simple 1D function case, we're just creating a, a, a piecewise straight line approximation of this, uh, of this function. Okay, so very, very simple uh, idea, uh, yet used everywhere in not just approximation theory, but design, engineering, solving differential equations all, all over the place. So there are two broad approaches to, to trying to, to build spline approximations. The first uh, is a, in a, the most powerful approach. Uh, and this is where we leave the, the partition completely unconstrained, which means we could put those cuts along this x-axis anywhere, anywhere that we like. And, and this is called free knot splines. Uh, this turns out to give the best approximation capability of a spline. The problem is, is that uh, this creates uh, basically an NP hard problem, 
right? Because we have to now, uh, in order to just even fit a, a, a free knot spline, because we have to now not only optimize the local mappings that we're going to use to approximate, but also the places where we put the breakpoints from one region to the next, or what's called the knots of our spline approximation. So this is extraordinarily computationally intensive. And so nobody actually uses uh, free knot splines in practice. What is used is uh, easier approaches, uh, either, for example, a, a fixed, simple fixed partition that will we'll just have the, we'll switch from one affine function to the next on a uniform grid, maybe every integer. Or maybe we'll switch on a dyadic grid. That turns out to be what wavelets are actually uh, doing. And in this case, where you, you make the partition very constrained, all you need to do is optimize the local mappings, and that's very straightforward. Okay, spoiler alert, what we're going to see in this talk is that deep networks are a, a, a machinery that is uh, actually enables one to, to produce approximations of free knot splines uh, in extraordinarily high dimensions, which is, uh, you know, has, has heretofore been not even thought about it. So it's so difficult. Okay, so we're going to talk about a particular formulation of doing affine splines. Uh, there's a number of ways to get to the same results that, that I'm, I, I'm going to talk about, but this is a particular attractive way of approaching it. It's the so-called max affine spline viewpoint of uh, Stephen Boyd and uh, David Dunson. Uh, and the idea here is let's, let, let's say that we want to approximate a convex function uh, using, our, uh, using our different uh, affine functions. Okay, so we we we've decided that uh, now we're in, we're in, in in arbitrary dimension, not just one dimension now. So x is in some uh, d-dimensional space. So we're going to approximate uh, this 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 uh, a convex function using our different pieces, right? Where each piece is uh, going to be just an affine function, just a hyperplane. Uh, and the, the, here are the equations of these hyperplanes, right? It's just a set of slopes. Uh, uh, we'll put in an A vector, and then a set of uh, uh, offsets or biases or y-intercepts that we'll put in this B, uh, in this B vector. And, let's, and we have our capital R of these. Here's what happens in 1D. Uh, let's, let's say that, that we fixed our set of slopes and our set of y-intercepts. Well, in one dimensional space, if we fixed, uh, uh, let's say we have R equals four, there'll be an A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, and A4, B4. This is gonna define four straight lines. And uh, what was shown by uh, uh, you know, Mag Mag Magnani and Boyd uh, uh, you know, a number of years ago, was that if you wanna approximate a convex function uh, using this kind of approach, then the the, 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 the choice of which spline to, or, or atomic local function to pick at each given uh, uh, interval is simply to, uh, chosen by taking the maximum. So if you want to do the, 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 uh, this, this piecewise affine approximation of this convex function, then what you do is you simply look for, uh, given any value x, you simply look for which of these four, in this case, lines dominates over all of the others. And we see that first, the line corresponding to A1, B1 dominates, and then A2, B2 dominates, A3, B3, and A4, B4 dominates. Okay, and so uh, it turns out this very simple convex optimization gives you, uh, uh, it tells you exactly where you should switch from one of these uh, affine functions to the next. And it's, it's in fact, this is the key idea that we're going to exploit in this talk, right? That given a set of affine parameters, now I'm not so interested in learning the A's and the B's. Let's just say I'm given a set of fixed A's and B's. Uh, that, that, that set of A's and B's via this maximization we just talked about implicitly and automatically defines the spline partition, right? So there's no, there's no, uh, work actually going on here to, uh, to actually you know, determine this partition. It's implicitly defined once we fix these sets of A's, uh, A and B parameters. And this is really gonna be the key thing that we're gonna exploit late, uh, for the rest of the talk, actually. Just to give you a, a, a feeling now to sort of segue towards 
uh, towards uh, deep networks. Let's look at a very simple one-dimensional uh, 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 operator function of taking a, a one-dimensional input x, scaling it by some gain a, adding a bias b, and then taking that output and putting it through a ReLU function. ReLU is uh, deep learning lingo for simply throwing away negative values and keeping positive values. Okay, turns out that the output of what I just described here in red can be written as this very simple maximization. Uh, and this should start to look fami uh, familiar, well, like we've just talked about in the previous uh, slide. In fact, this is a max affine spline optimization where uh, big R is two, <coughs> excuse me, A1 and B1 are just zero, zero. That corresponds to this uh, uh, first term in this max. And then A2, B2 are just this A and B, just the, the gain and this offset B. Okay? And so we see that, that scaling uh, uh, a one-dimensional variable, adding a bias, putting it through a threshold or a ReLU function, it, it corresponds to a max affine spline approximation of some convex function, right? Of course, it's a pretty crappy uh, approximation in this, in this case that I illustrate here. But nevertheless, it is this uh, set of operations is, is a max affine spline. And this should start hopefully start to turn some gears in your mind as we think about more complicated or involved uh, operators. Okay, just before we move on to that, let's define one more thing, and that's uh, well, let's concatenate a bunch of max affine splines, spline functions, into a spline operator. Okay, so now uh, instead of having a, a d dimensional input x and a set of parameters a and b that map to one single scalar valued output here, this light blue color, uh, that would be a max affine spline. Let's actually have a uh, big K of these max affine splines with different A and B parameters, and let's stack them into a vector output. And now we have what we'll call a max affine spline operator. It's just a collection of max affine splines that maps D dimensional inputs to big K uh, dimensional outputs. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. And we'll call these MASOs uh, or uh, uh, MASO. Okay, so, so let's uh, now turn back to deep networks. And let me just state uh, you know, the, key, the key result that's going to enable all of the uh, examples and illustrations I'm going to talk about uh, for the rest of the, the talk. Uh, I'm going to talk, you know, that there's, there's no time in one hour to do a complete tutorial of, of all of the world state-of-the-art deep learning architectures. But the good news is that uh, basically all of these state-of-the-art networks that are used today, and I give a whole bunch of buzzwords here, but, but you know, the, these uh, types of networks, ResNets, ConNets, Inception Nets, right? Uh, all of these deep net architectures today uh, employ piecewise affine operators as their layers, meaning these pink, blue, and green operators are, are simply affine, affine operators, right? And they have all kinds of jargony names in the deep learning literature, fully connected layers, that's just a matrix multiplication, that's certainly affine. Convolution plus a bias, that's also affine. This ReLU function that we just talked about, uh, which is just a thresholding. This is also a fine. Uh, all of these different subsampling techniques uh, that, that are, again, have to be called something different because this is deep learning. They're called pooling operators. These are also a fine operations. Okay? And so the, the, the really handy thing is that the entire world of deep learning today, I'm not saying it's going to be like that in five years, but of deep learning today is really a piece, uh, composition of piecewise lin uh, affine uh, operators. Okay. We can actually state a theorem now that uh, these, these deep net layers of all of these state-of-the-art networks are max affine spline operators. Okay. And so uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that a, 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 any deep net that you pick up today that, that, that is you know, high performing and was developed in the last five years uh, that maps an input uh, X to a predicted label Y, 
is going to be built from a composition of operators, each of which is a max affine spline operator. Okay, which is quite interesting, which, which actually says that every, uh, every one of these layers that the deep net is built from is actually convex with respect to the, it's actually a convex operator. Okay, so you can actually see a deep net as a composition of, of uh, convex operators. And of course, since it's a composition of convex operators, that doesn't mean that the overall composition is convex. Of course, it's, it's non-convex in, in general. And that's, uh, that, that's, really, uh, that's really important, okay? So just to kind of make it, to restate everything one more time, given a standard deep net that's used today, the individual layers are going to, each of them is going to be a max affine spline operator and is going to be a convex operator. The overall input to output mapping or the mapping from the input to any point within the network or from any point in the network to any other point of the network is going to just be a simple affine spline. It's not going to be uh, convex, but it's still going to be uh, an affine spline operator. Okay, so this is a very simple uh, to, to establish. Okay, uh, that's not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is, is actually not that the layers of deep nets are splines, but rather that given the parameters of these layers, we can, we can infer the, the, the regions, the partitioning of the deep net. And that's actually where it get really in, is, is, is studying the, the partitioning geometry of a deep network, because that's actually where the magic, uh, where the magic happens, okay? So let's just go back and recall, right, that, that uh, if we have a, uh, just, just by analogy to this very simple one-dimensional problem at the bottom, right? But given a trained deep net, what do I mean by that? I mean a deep net that, that maybe Deanna has gone out and she's got a collection of training data and she view, she's used her latest uh, fancy learning algorithm in order to find all of the parameters in this deep net, right? These parameters basically define the A's and the B's, right, of these max affine spline operators. Well, that means since we, Deanna has fixed those parameters, what we can do now is we can actually infer, right, the, the, the uh, geometry of the, 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 the spline partition that her uh, uh, deep net has actually created, right, in either the input space or anywhere intermediate uh, throughout uh, the network. And so, what we're going to see uh, through a really simple example is that the, the, the parameters of in, uh, each deep net layer are going to induce a partition, right, given a layer. Uh, and this is, uh, here we have the, uh, the, 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 out, uh, the sorry, uh, we have the, the input and the output to this particular layer, right? Well, given the parameters of that particular layer, there's going to be a, a, a spline partitioning of the input space of that layer into convex regions, right? And we're going to be able to, to elicit that from the, 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 the parameters of that particular region. Moreover, if there are a number of layers, we're going to be able to see that there's going to be a non-convex partition of the input space that is generated by those multiple layers. And, and, and this allows us to make some, some links between D networks and ideas that you might be familiar with. Uh, whether you're a geometer or statistician or an information theorist, you might call these different things, but they're all the same thing. Voronoi tilings, uh, if you're a geometry person, uh, k-means algorithm, if you're a statistician, or vector quantization, if you're a signal processing or information theorist. So, so really you can think of a deep net as a vector quantization machine, okay? So let's, let me illustrate with a really simple uh, example that's uh, it, it, about the simplest uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can get. Uh, let's, let's do a toy example of a, a three-layer deep net. It's not that deep, but uh, it, just has, it has three layers. We have a two-dimensional input space. Why two dimensions? Because we can only visualize in low dimensions. So let's keep the input to be two dimensions. Then we go through a a matrix multiplication, 
not even a convolution, just a matrix multiplication. We add a bias vector, uh, then we go through a thresholding operation, a ReLU, to get a 45-dimensional uh, output. So this, the input, uh, this would be a matrix that would be a 45 by two-dimensional matrix. Uh, and then we, we take that 45-dimensional input, we go again through a matrix multiplication, again a uh, thresholding or ReLU operation to a three-dimensional uh, uh, output. And then finally, we go through uh, a, an operation that I haven't talked about at all, but we, we really don't need to worry about it very much for this talk. We go through then what's called a softmax operation, basically another matrix multiplication, uh, followed by uh, just a renormalization of the, uh, of the output that such that, that you can think of the four uh, output variables here in this output vector is simply a histogram over the four classes. So we're interested in, in telling whether a two-dimensional input, here's my picture, whether a two-dimensional input that has a, uh, a, there's an X1 axis and an X2 axis, each point here, a data point, uh, whether uh, we'd like to, to build a classifier to tell whether an input in this two-dimensional input plane uh, is, comes either from the green class, red class, blue class, or cyan class. Okay, and so we're gonna get, simply get a probability distribution here of uh, given an input, given the probability it's in the green, red, blue, or cyan class. Hopefully this makes sense to everybody. So, so throwing it back, Anna, she has applied her uh, uh, new learning algorithm to infer all of the parameters of this network. What are the parameters? They're simply the, the matrix, entries in the matrices here, here, and here. The bias vectors that we add here, here, and here. And that's it. Okay, that's all the, the parameters. Given these parameters now, though, we can figure out using, again, this maxifying spline idea, we can actually figure out the uh, partition. And here's the partition after we go from the input space, okay, input space to the output of the very first layer. Okay, recall it was going from 2D to 45 dimensional. And what we see is the 2D, two dimensional input space has been diced up to the, a whole bunch of convex regions. You can verify these are all basically are cones that have been pulled away from, uh, 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 pulled away from the origin, okay? Uh, you can verify just by eyeballing it that these are all uh, convex, okay? And, uh, and now this lets us make the identification that the mapping of this deep net from the input X, okay, uh, to the output of this layer is actually quite simply described, okay? Simply defined by a matrix times x plus a uh, plus an offset. Where does it, it turns out that for every single x that lives inside this particular tile, right, this tile of our, our partition, okay, the a is exactly the same and the b is exactly the same. Why? Because this is a spline, right? Recall that splines first partition the input space into a number of regions and then fit a very simple function on each of those regions. Okay, in this case, it's an affine mapping, right, with uh, some matrix A and some uh, uh, offset B. And I have this funny notation here where Q of X is telling me that my X fell into this particular region, right, this particular region. That Q of X just tells me which uh, particular region. So that's what happens from the input to the output of the first layer. Now let's look at the output input to the output of the second layer. Okay, now we've gone through two of these affine mappings. The individual are convex. As a co combined, they're no longer convex. It's a non-convex operator. You can see this uh, all the, uh, uh, manifested in the fact that the uh, partition regions now are non-convex. You can identify several of them here that are non-convex regions. But nevertheless, we still have this identification that this input to output of second layer mapping remains an affine spline. Okay, it's no longer approximating a convex operator, it's approximating a non-convex operator, but nevertheless, it's an affine spline, meaning that 
all X's that fall into this particular region here in, in the input space, right? Uh, we'll have to them the exact same matrix A and offset B applied to them, okay? Applied to them. So, so again, it's, it's a spline. We, we partition the input space and then we just apply in each partition region one of these very simple mappings in a fine mapping. Right? Hopefully this makes sense. You can continue on through other layers. This is an interesting picture showing, set of pictures showing as we learn using back propagation learning, this iterative gradient descent uh, type uh, learning, we see that when we start, oops, when we start with an initial initialization of our network, random uh, matrix entries, so-called weights, and all of the biases B set to zero, we see we just have a set of cones. Uh, at uh, at uh, initialization, and that as we learn the parameters of the network, this is for two layers. We see these cones not only broaden and and, and narrow, but they also get pulled away from the origin by virtue of the the bees, right? These uh, these uh, 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 offset uh, parameters that that, that we're uh, learning. So hopefully this makes sense. So. Let's, this has been a toy example, but now let's look at a number of uh, things that we can probe, use to probe deeper into deep nets, and in particular, the, the, the geometry of, of deep networks. So we've been working uh, quite extensively on this over the last uh, year or so, and we've been able to establish some kind of interest, what, what I think are some interesting results about uh, uh, the geometry of a deep network uh, partition. Recall again what I talked about at the be near the beginning that a you can view deep net deep networks with their associated back propagation gradient descent learning as a, 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 a computationally somewhat tractable approach to doing free knot splines in high dimensions, which recall is so impossible that people don't even think about it in anything beyond two dimensions. So here we are doing free knot spline approximations in hundreds of thousands of dimensions. So it's, it's kind of you know, extraordinary, right? That, that, this, that, this can work, uh, that this can work at all. So we've been studying the particular partition, uh, uh, the structure of these partitions that are formed by a, a deep net. And it turns out it has a, there's a very rich structure thanks to this fact that these maxifying spline operators are, are applied hierarchically, layer after layer in, uh, in uh, the network. And it turns out, first thing, I was a bit sort of uh, fast and loose earlier when I said that a, uh, a deep network, the geometry of a deep network is a, is a Voronoi tiling, because in fact, it's not a Vor exactly a Voronoi tiling. It's, an ex it's a generalization of the Voronoi tiling that you probably haven't heard of before, but it's something called a power diagram, right? This comes up in computational geometry. And it turns out power diagrams are defined very similarly to a Voronoi tiling. Recall that a Voronoi tiling, you have a centroid, and then the tiling is defined as uh, the tile associated with a particular centroid is all of the points in the, the space that are closest in Euclidean distance to that centroid. That's a Voronoi tiling. A, po a power diagram uh, tiling uh, uses not Euclidean distance, but something called a Legendre distance that is essentially like a biased Euclidean distance. So you not only have a centroid in a power diagram, but also a parameter called a radius that allows you to, it basically morphs the, 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 uh, when the radius is zero, you have a Voronoi diagram, and when the radius is large, it's very far from a, a Voronoi diagram. It turns out still, though, the tiles are, are convex polytope. That's easy to, that was established uh, uh, you know, decades ago. Uh, it turns out for a deep network, if again, Deanna hands us the parameters of her deep network, we actually have closed form formulas for the uh, centroids, these centroids, and the radii in terms of these affine mapping parameters that we, we talked about earlier, right? Given that you fall in a particular tile, again, here's the tile, turns out the radius and centroid are determined by the affine mapping that's applied in that tile. So that's kind of fun. Uh, second, it turns out that the way these tiles are, are, are 
are formed is via a subdivision process that is not unlike it's somehow related or not unlike what goes on for example in like a wavelet or some other subdivision type uh, uh, signal decompositions uh, and and the basic idea is that each layer right each layer makes a number of of hyperplane cuts in the input space so here here's an example of a of a very simple two-dimensional input space where the input, uh, the mapping from the input to the output of the first layer turns out to create six hyperplane, in this case they're just simple lines, uh, cuts of that space that creates uh, our uh, uh, a convex tiling of this uh, space going from the input to the output of, of the first layer. Okay, it turns out that what happens in the second layer is that the second layer retains all of those cuts that were formed from the first layer, okay? But additional cuts, hyperplane cuts, are, are, are added, are basically imposed upon, or su we're subdividing the cuts from the first layer with cuts from the second layer. But now, very interestingly, these hyperplane cuts caused by the second layer are actually bent, okay? They're actually no longer straight lines. They're bent. And it is this bending that is needed in order to maintain the continuity of our spline uh, of our spline approximation. Okay, and you can actually calculate again closed form in terms of these A's and B's of these uh, mapping the affine mapping parameters every given region. The dihedral angle of bending, how much it needs to bend. Okay, which can tell us a lot of very interesting things about uh, the geometry. Uh, in particular, okay, in particular, uh, the, the, if you're interested in a classification problem, uh, it turns out the decision boundary in, let's say, a two-class classification problem, cats are on this side, images of cats, images of dogs are on this side, it turns out the smoothness of the decision boundary tells you a lot about the generalization capability of this particular classifier. And it turns out understanding these dihedral angles, right, of the de decision boundary, which is, it turns out, just a single final cut, single hyperplane cut in, uh, in uh, this final layer. It turns out that the, the, the buildup of all of these dihedral angles as we go through this multi-scale um, uh, buildup of this overall power diagram tiling uh, actually tell you a lot about the, 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 the overall smoothness of this final uh, boundary. So hopefully that makes sense. I was maybe rambling a bit, but this is a, a really interesting direction for future work. And it is, you know, there's some, some other really interesting work uh, going on out there. There's a very nice paper by uh, Inger Dobushi, Ron Vore, and others uh, on this uh, that I you know, highly recommend you, you have a peek at. Okay. So that's, that's thinking about uh, the geometry that's going on in this uh, uh, free knot spline approximation of the prediction operator. The other thing we can look at is these, the, these A's and B's, these, uh, 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 the, the affine mappings uh, uh, that, that are applied locally to, to, this, to all of the inputs that live within a particular tile in this high dimensional space. And it turns out these mappings have a very natural, uh, very natural interpretation in terms of something totally classical from signal process. So let's, let's go back to looking again to a multi-layer deep network. We have an input that's mapping to the, uh, the output. Uh, and let's call the output ZL. We have L big layers. CNN just means convolutional uh, neural network. And as I you know, talked about many times over the last uh, bunch of minutes, we know that the, there's, it's a the mapping from X to ZL is a spline, it's a spline map. Right, which means the input space of all x's is broken up into a partition, and then within each partition region, there is a uh, each partition region, a particular one uh, for a given x. There's a q of x, which, in, which indexes a particular a of q of x and a particular b of q of x. Right, and in fact, it turns out that we have form formulas for these a's uh, and for these b's. Here are the formulas for these A's and B's. And we can study 
uh, the structure of these A's and B's. And for now, let, let's just focus on this per, the particular A of Q of X. And let's just think for a second about uh, what, 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 like make an interpretation of this. We put in an image, X here, and we get an output, we get out an output, okay? This is our output ZL, output ZL is here, input X is here. And the mapping that takes us from X to ZL yeah, the linear part of the mapping is just this matrix A of Q, okay? So we can think of, if we're in this simple four class classification problem, Z will be four dimensional, right? X will be some other dimension, doesn't really matter, okay? But the output will be four dimensional. And uh, it, re recall that, that uh, for classification, in particular using this softmax uh, type setup, what we're going to do is we're going to take an input, it's this particular picture, we're going to run it through the deep network, get the ZL, and then we're going to renormalize that ZL with this so-called softmax function. But then we're going to take the biggest, the, the entry of this four-dimensional vector, right, where the entries correspond to the probability of it being a dog, cat, a boat, or a bird, we're going to take the biggest one. Why? because we're doing a probabilistic type of classification, we want the most likely class label, okay? So if you think about what are you doing, you're actually taking X, figuring out what partition region you come from in the input space, maybe you're over here, you're getting that particular matrix, you're multiplying it by X, and then you're getting an output. Well, what are the rows of this matrix A? Turns out there's four rows, right? So. I have a picture of a lot more rows, but there'll really just be four of them. What are those rows? Well, what you're doing is you're taking four vectors that are the rows of this A, you're multiplying it by X, and then you're looking for the biggest inner product, actually, because what is matrix multiplication? It's just the inner product between these four rows with the input X. You want the biggest output. What is this? This is simply a match filter, right? This is something that's completely classical in signal processing, that if we're looking for an, for an airplane flying out there, we send out a rate of, uh, well, I won't even go into it. We all know about uh, either match filters or, or, or sliding window cross correlation as it's, it's referred to in the uh, uh, statistics uh, world. And we also know that this is in fact an optimal classifier for finding a target in at least white uh, Gaussian noise, okay? And so what this is telling us is that a, a uh, deep network is constructing a signal dependent match filter bank that given an input X, that the per per partition region that you fall into is creating an A, right, of Q of X. Uh, the rows of this A are a match filter bank, okay? And it turns out that you can actualize these match filters. These have been called saliency maps in the past, uh, but now we actually have a a, a, a rigorous understanding of what with these, these saliency maps are. So let's do a numerical example. Here's an input from the CIFAR uh, 10 data sets, an airplane. And uh, we, let's say we wanna solve a three class classification problem. Is this an airplane, a ship, or a dog? Okay, well, we put in the, we've learned a network to solve this uh, problem. Again, thank you, Deanna. And uh, now we've input an X, uh, this picture, clearly of a plane, into this network. Well, we can, we, we know the input X, we know the partition region where this X fell into, and we can actually now look at that, the matrix A, right, the particular three rows of that matrix A. Here they are. Okay? If we revisualize those rows as images, we see, uh, if you squint in a kind of a, a squinty way, you can see that that they all kind of look like planes, but as a matter of fact, this, uh, the, the, the plane channel, if you will, looks fairly similar to our input image, whereas uh, the, the uh, ship and dog channels turn out to be sort of like anti-planes. Numbers that I have here are the inner products, unnormalized inner products between the input X and this particular image. Input X, this image, input X, and this image. There are three match filters. And you see that clearly this match filter has by far the larger uh, output value, which is why the network would, would, would select that the, or, or, or infer that this is a picture of an airplane. 
right? So I call these anti-match filters because here you're in the ship case, you're forcing close to zero. In the dog case, you're actually forcing close to, close to negative infinity. Because of the normalization by softmax, that will be set to like a zero probability. Okay, so this connection now, there's a rigorous connection between deep networks and a kind of a signal dependent learned matched uh, filter bank. Okay, you can also do some other interesting things uh, from information theory. So now uh, uh, we think again of if we've learned uh, the parameters of a network, uh, uh, that will in automatically induce a a vector quantization partition of our, our input space here. Uh, and it turns out that you can associate with each of these tiles, you can actually associate a code word, a binary code word. So what is the binary code word for this blue tile, uh, of the tile of X's over here? It turns out if you just take the learn network, feed in any input that is in this particular tile, you'll get a pattern from the thresholds or from the ReLUs, some ReLUs will actually be uh, triggered to pass through a positive value, and some will be not triggered. They'll have a negative input and they'll set the output to zero. If you call triggering and passing the value through a one and not triggering and passing a zero to the output, a zero, you can have a code word that will describe uniquely each one of these different tiles. Now that we have a code word, we can actually say, well, I, I will describe the distance between the blue signals and the red signals. I don't want to use Euclidean distance, though. I'm going to use the Hamming distance between the code words, right? The code words, and that's why I've been using Q of X, uh, at, in this case, Q of X1, Q of X2. And this is very easily uh, computed. And it basically tell, uh, it is the the code words that correspond to the vec truly the vector quantization of not just the input data that we've used to train, but of the entire input space. Okay? You, can, you can actually show that this Hamming uh, distance based on the vector quantized uh, 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 code words is uh, closely related to a, a, not the Euclidean distance between data points, but the geodesic distance between points in high dimensional space, which we know is uh, much more appropriate when we're studying, for example, classification problems like trying to tell whether it's a picture of Anna, maybe, or of Ingrid, okay? And so this is, to, to me, a very interesting you know, future direction, uh, again, leveraging this uh, a vector quantization viewpoint of the input space in order to come up with new kinds of distances that relate to classic manifold type distances that, that have been exploited for image processing uh, over the last uh, three decades or so. Let me just end by saying, uh, you know, even though essentially all networks, uh, deep networks today still imply piecewise affine operators, it turns out that the, the theory of uh, that I've talked about extends very naturally to m more old school uh, ne neural networks using uh, activation functions uh, like the sigmoid, right? Which is kind of like a smooth or the uh, arc tangent that are somehow smooth versions of this ReLU uh, nonlinearity. It turns out, again, exploiting this vector quantization viewpoint. Uh, it's uh, uh, really straightforward to move uh, from a, uh, to, to see that, that using, for example, a ReLU activation function, we can think about we're in a, what's called a hard vector quantization of the input space. Uh, moving from a hard vector quantization where X here is in this region and no other region, to a so-called soft vector quantization where we have a probability distribution that now says this X is most likely to come from this tile, but with low probability, it might have actually been from one of these neighboring tiles. It turns out if you adopt this uh, using a very simple Gaussian mixture model, you can define infinite classes of uh, uh, smooth nonlinearities. Uh, are, uh, and in fact, each of these uh, you know, modern uh, piecewise affine uh, nonlinearities actually 
induces an infinite class of smooth nonlinearities uh, that have some very interesting properties. And in particular, there are some smooth nonlinearities around the ReLU, for example, uh, that actually offer a slightly improved performance uh, in deep nets. And this has been you know, explored by, by people, but now we actually have a theoretical explanation because it turns out these empirically observed better, smoother linear nonlinearities actually live in this class uh, of, of this soft vector quantization uh, uh, viewpoint. Okay, so let me end this saying the what's the punchline uh, of everything I've been talking about is that this maxifying spline viewpoint provides, uh, you know, we believe a really nice foundation to reason about the global a global representation for deep learning systems, and in particular, a geometric viewpoint of these uh, deep, uh, deep learning systems. Uh, we started by connecting the individual layers of a deep network to maxifying spline operators. We showed that, that this allowed us to think about a deep net as doing a composition of VQ dependent affine transformations. We saw that the the geometry is a subdivided power diagram, and that there's lots of very interesting questions to be explored there. Uh, we could relate, thanks to this, deep networks back to classical signal processing techniques like uh, match filter banks. Uh, and we also uh, looked at the ways that we can develop new kinds of uh, distances between signals. Uh, and we can even come up with new kinds of regularization methods for learning based on uh, these kind of ideas. Okay, so I'll just end by saying there's going to be a lot more work uh, coming out in this uh, direction. We've been uh, a team of us that are very interested in these kinds of ideas was uh, uh, recently funded to have an interdisciplinary uh, multi-university research effort. Uh, and so there's actually going to be a, a, a workshop, uh, kickoff workshop sometime in October if you're interested in, in joining uh, the workshop, uh, we would uh, love to have you just send me an email uh, and that will be taking place later uh, in October of this year. So with that, I will end and have about uh, uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Thanks so much for the invitation again. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for an excellent talk. Um, I'd like to remind the attendees to ask their questions through the Q&A tool and I will I'll give it a give people uh, an opportunity now to start asking questions starting with I guess any questions that the uh, other panelists have. Yeah, so I have a quick question Rich. So sure. um, I'm wondering if there's any uh, way to connect um, this particular framework with the actual learning algorithms that get used for uh, picking the A's and B's that you end up yeah, with. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I'll just, uh, I'm sure there, 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 there are, but all we really have, unfortunately, at this point, very limited, just scratching at the surface. That, in fact, is a major goal of this, uh, this, this, this initiative that we have kicking off, right, with folks like for example, Stan Osher and Tom Goldstein, right? Really looking at how learning relates to de developing these power, these, these hierarchical power diagram splits. Um, but uh, you know, so far, we, we yeah, it's a, I would say pretty wide open. So great question, but I don't have a lot to add. 